demanded a motherfucking hour. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hold on, let me, let me prep my shit. Hold on. The computer focuses a different way. Uh, all right. I think, let me see if I could tilt it the other way, actually. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Something like this, maybe? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That works. I see you, bro. I see you, bro. Thanks, man. How goes it? Oh, dope. Looking good. You're looking good. Thank you, buddy. Uh, all right. Something like that. All right, man. How you what? doing? Dude, I'm... I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I'm doing. <laughs> Shit is fucking wild out here, bro. Where you at now? In L.A.? I'm in L.A., yeah. L.A.? Yep. That's what's up. Well, first and foremost, man, I, I want to uh, welcome you to the Acquired Taste podcast. Really appreciate you stopping by, man. I know you're a busy, busy man. So I know just taking the time out to talk to us, you know, you're probably missing some money. So, so I appreciate that. No problem. So first off, man, because you know you're an you're you're an Ohio guy, okay? I seen the Ohio, yes, sir. I seen the Ohio Hip Hop Award on your on your wall back there. Yeah, so, Executive of the Year, 2016. That's like that means a great deal to me, like more so than like my Grammy nomination with DMX. Like I'm recognized as the best at what I do in a state from where I come from. Like, how many people can say that? You are the absolute best at what you do. You know? Facts. And what I've been, from what I see, I mean, that, that there's, there's no lie there. <laughs> that, Thank you. That's the absolute truth, man. And like I said, I've been following you for years, bro. I've probably been following you for at least 10 plus years, man. Because one of the reasons I follow you is because it seems like you A&R all the artists that I love, you know what I'm saying? Like, first off, the Wu-Tang Clan. Like, I grew up with the Wu-Tang Thank Wu. you. So, just by mm -hmm. every time I see you, you like where you got the Wu shirts on, like, you be rapping for real. And I see you yep. just, uh, you just, uh, a and or you just uh, dropped that Ghostface. Uh, the Ghostface was a five-year uh, anniversary re-release. Okay. But to date, that's the record I'm most proud of because the biggest budget album I did before that was 2005 Wu-Tang Meets Indie Culture. Now, that was my first ever attempt at working behind the scenes as an A&R, as an A&R admin, as an executive, outside of making an M80 album, you know, where I, I'm the artist, plus I know how to do all this shit. So Wu-Tang Indie Culture, that was none of my own money. That was Dreddy and investors and stuff. And then the deal was broker with Baby Grand. So we were, he was recouped 100% and already in profit before the album came out. So that taught me a lot about how to like budget financially to make these albums. And then, you know, you have to take the risk yourself. You have to believe in the product. You know, and a lot of artists seem to not have a grasp of that because all they see is people getting money and think that every record deal is supposed to be for six, seven figures and every show is supposed to be for five figures and better and they're not willing to work their way up the pole. So I came up with the idea for the Ghostface album and originally it was a Ghostface album with Kill a Priest and produced by Big Ghost. Now Ghostface, two things, immediately took issue with Big Ghost being the producer because if you don't remember at home, for a lot of years, Big Ghost was the blogger that pretended he was Ghostface. And he'd make these blog posts, like, like sounding like Ghostface. Like, yo, fam, what's up, man? This is, you know, cocaine biceps. <laughs> like, and, you know, who's the 10, to, uh, 10 softest rappers in the game? Man, Tyga is 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 uh, Johnson & Johnson, Luberderm soft son. And, like, make fun of all these people. And then Ghostface would get the backlash. But it really wasn't Ghostface, you know, but people believed it because when you read the blog post, you'd read it how you think Ghostface would sound. Right. And it kind of sounds sound like Ghost. So, so Ghostface took issue with that at first, with Big Ghost being the producer. Then he looked at my budget report and he was like, okay, well, I'll take all this money. So what's Priest supposed to make? And it's like, that was the budget for the whole shit. <laughs> Priest was mad at me and not Ghost. And it's like, that didn't make any fucking sense to me. I did this with 
you two and mine together. But I'm not going to just increase the budget like crazily. Like, dude, it was already the most amount of money I'd ever spent making any one album by a long shot. I spent double what it costs to make Wu-Tang Indie Culture. And that has RZA and MF Doom and all sorts of members of Wu-Tang Clan and all sorts of members of the industry elites, you know, independent underground, like Dell and Aesop Rock and, and so on and so forth. So it's like, I spent double that shit. Now, Wu-Tang Indie Culture made a million dollars plus. My goal with the Ghostface album was to make $400,000. So when I laid out the program to him, I was like, if we do this together, we could split this amount of money. He's like, I know you know what you're talking about. I just don't see it how you see it. So like, just pay me X and I'll do it. Now, I could have saved half the budget if I would have just had Bronze Nazareth produce it or something. He right. really took sure. issue with it being Ghostface and Big Ghost because of all that stigma I told you about. I had to go back to the drawing board and think to myself, can I really make money at this investment level Knowing that, remember that your budget—it's like it's like when you people that buy and flip homes, it's right. never what it seems. You always have added expenses. Like we didn't initially have Snoop Dogg and E40 and Big Daddy Kane on it. Those are obviously big expenditures, you know. Um, but then I came up with the like you know the notion: yes, I can make the money. I worst case scenario, I break even and can say I executive produced the Ghostface Killer album. Um, but I decided to make the full length album. And then do the remix album, which was Bronze Nazareth and Agala. And then, you know, just like the supplementals, like the instrumentals, um, a double disc CD with the album and instrumentals, then the five-year anniversary. Now, the reason we did this, and I had to explain to Ghost, because I did certain distribution record deals, content license deals. And again, this could never be replicated either. I did like five or six different deals for the same album with different companies granting them different rights. Again, it's like some Wu Tang shit where it's like RZA signed allowed, not because they gave him the most money, but because it availed him to the most opportunity. So I went with who was going to give me the most leeway and opportunity to do what I wanted to do. And that's unheard of. I could honestly never replicate that move again. So I give this company the derivative rights, which is the rights to press the physicals for the remix album. I gave this company the digital rights for both the lost tapes. And for um, uh, the ghost files, then I give this company overseas the vinyl rights, the CD rights, like a variant CD, the cassette tape rights. Then I give this company the rights to do the album with the with the instrumentals. Then I kept rights to do the merch and and CDs and autograph posters. So it's like the income streams were coming in like crazy from that. And like I said, I'm grateful it happened in the time frame it happened because. I could never, ever replicate five, six record deals for the same project, guaranteeing, you know, literally when I brokered the deal for the Ghost Files, that reimbursed me in full. And now I have these four other deals and streams to eat off of and make it make sense. But um, yeah, I, I wish I could write a book about the making of that album and the aftermath of that album, because I feel like, you know, Wu-Tang is a very humongous circle. You got your core members, you got the fam members, and the fam members have their fam, and everyone's got their own group, but it's like, I know I do great business. I've a 40 plus Wu-Tang products between the clan, the generals, the family, the whole nine, but it's like, not everyone that's on the outside looking in or works in the business for a particular member is an M80 fan at all. And that just goes with, you know, I have to walk that path every day. Who fucks with me? Who doesn't fuck with me? Do they fucking matter to me and proceed? Exactly. Sounds good. Well, you know what? Because you gave us a lot of information there. So before we go any further, can you just give us a, a breakdown of who you are and how you became one of the biggest hip hop ARs in the industry? My name is Matthew Amady Markoff, born and raised in the Midwest between Toledo, Ohio, and Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, been rapping since I was 13. I'm 42 uh, as of this past November. And I'd be belated. Thank you, sir. Um, I was just like a freestyle artist. I didn't write a song until after like three years of just freestyling. And I always used to get into ciphers and, and battles and stuff in the commons and school between middle school and high school. And um, when I started rapping, like making songs, it was on a karaoke machine. 
And, you know, like, so my, I remember the very first beat I ever rapped over was, uh, um, uh, fuck, the, uh, on The Chronic, like Dr. Dre and Snoop, um, nothing but a G thing, okay? And then just, like, other shits from there. And CD burners weren't a thing yet. Like, CDs were out in the market like that. Remember, they used to come in the big cardboards? Like, kids have no idea today, man. No. Like, if you go on like, eBay and look up a copy of The Chronic sealed in a big cardboard thing, it's like $3,000. Right. It's yeah. classic. That's a classic album. Classic. You know, so I would literally <laughs> record an album with no like mixing and mastering involved, period. And like dub the cassette tapes in my parents' basement and go from there. And I just would put out a CD or a tape every year and sell them throughout the school year. And then whatever money I made is what I made and I'd move on to the next. Um, my first album that was on CD and distributed in stores throughout the Midwest was called the 11th hour i'm sorry um, um the expert explosive then i did a brief stint in prison a lot of people don't know that about me and i never talk about it unless it's brought up randomly but um i was in prison for six months and wrote like every fucking day now people <laughs> always ask me what my experience in prison was like and it's they want to hear like horror stories and stuff but it was the exact opposite of horror stories because everyone in prison works Everyone has to have a job. I went to prison when I was at IEPUI College, and I was the elected student body president. So when I went to prison, I had the highest educational degree. And so I was given the job of GED tutor. So if you're in my GED class and you get your GED, you get a six-month time cut, okay? Mm. So I was the safest kept motherfucker in prison, bro. <laughs> right. And I, now this, this is some other crazy shit. I was in an all-black gang. Mm. Called the wolf pack. So it did get uncomfortable at times because the whites viewed me as a race traitor. But I didn't want to be with the whites because they're all fucking Aryans and I'm Jewish. Like, that's insane. Like, I'm never going to subscribe to that way of thinking, even like if, if death is imminent, right. I would die first, like on some Holocaust shit. Like, I'm not going to fucking denounce my religion to live a lie. Like, that's never going to happen. So I got fucking. Mad Diesel in prison, bro. I came out like I bench pressed like two seventy five. Like I think that's the only time <laughs> motherfuckers feared me, you know. But now they're just like and ladies, just like you know, don't start no shit, won't be no shit kind of guy. <laughs> that's what it is, you know. I just want right. to get my work done, do my shit, but people keep keep trying to you know be problems in my life for whatever reason. Um, got out of prison and just kept making these albums. And I did a show in Indianapolis for the release of Snakes in the Garden of 80. And I sold out a venue on my own because all the kids in college, it was a venue that was like 18 and up. So all the college kids could come. If you're 21 up, you can drink. If not, you're still in the building. They, a lot of those clubs don't exist. So from that one show, I was getting booked all over Indianapolis. And then I was doing a show downtown Indy at this club called Tiki Bob's one night. And I walked past the cube where I did my release party and saw that there was a Wu-Tang flyer on there. And it's like, Raekwon, Inspector Deck, Capadonna, Killer Priest, Remedy, La the Dark Man coming like two nights in a row. So I went inside. I'm like, you've got to put me on the show. Like, I love Wu-Tang and other music front to back. Like, they're like, oh, of course we'll put you on. Like, if they don't sell it out, you'll sell it out. But like, beautiful. Right. So did right. the show the first night. It was indoors. And then hung out with Priest and Cap and everyone afterwards. Solomon Childs was there um, and brought my giant CD book of Wu-Tang Records. There's like 400 some CDs in this at this point. And like Solomon's like, how do you have that album? Like, I don't even have that. And I'm talking to Priest about things I like and don't like about previous projects. And they're like, yo, are you going to be here tomorrow? I'm like, yeah, I'm opening them up. So they all watched my set the next night. And the tour manager, his name was Marty Diamond, a.k.a. Marty Laporte. And he was like, if you want to finish out this tour with me, you can. So I'm in college. I got classes like Monday, Wednesday, Friday at like 930 in the morning. And I still went and did like 10 additional shows, just did my performance, sold merch, said what's up to the guys. Like wouldn't even get to see the whole set sometimes. And then would have to drive back to Indy to make sure I made class the next day. I never, I missed one class ever between high school, college, and law school. So we're talking like 10 years of schooling. I missed one class. Jeez. Ever. Um, and the one class I missed was in law school 
it was Valentine's Day, and I flew to New York to see Wu Tang Clan at the Hammerstein Ballroom, and flew back and missed missed one class. That was it, but it was fucking worth it. Of course, but it was what I about to say, but it was worth it. So, <laughs> it worth it. Um, but from that tour, Marty was handling other tours, so it's like I did that tour and did like a dozen dates. Then I do a couple dates with Ghostface. I do a couple dates with Meth. A couple dates with Jizza, and that's when I met Dreddy was we did a show in Chicago at the Metro. Oh, uh, I did and I ended up doing a bunch of shows at the Metro. In fact, the first time I ever opened up for Wu Tang Clan as a whole was at the Metro. Um and I met Dreddy and Dreddy wanted to launch Think Differently Music. So that was his brainchild. And I'm like, I want in. Like I'm 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 I never sold Wu Tang on I'm a dope rapper. Like fuck with me. Like I have songs with with Priest and Dreddy on my 2003 album, The Eleventh Hour. Uh, but other than that, as I met Jizza, Meth, Ghost, Rizzo, all these people, I never sold them on that foot. Like Master Killer told me, and we were in a meeting in Sundance. This was like three years ago, but when they dropped the show on Showtime, the uh, the Wu Tang, the four part docu series. He's like, I had no idea you rap, and we have like two or three songs together. <laughs> you know because i never was like super vocal about it it's like i stepped to these people with business first so they would respect me as the business then if the rap shit came about later so be it you know and i end up having songs with like the majority of them like i got a song with rizza i got songs with uh ghosts wait no I have songs with, with master killer um with priest with cap you know we did almighty two with cap so it's like that's how i got my start with wu-tang and i feel like you know i have a few wu-tang records left that are like the master killer album balance is done i i a and r the single on it i did the a side b side single for master killers um selling my soul uh we have new product from wild the dark man um war cloud for next year and, and mathematics, there's a whole album on mathematics at AR. He works only three or four albums at a time. Um, I think that will probably like wrap up my my Wu Tang saga. Okay. By that by that point, I'll be like 45 some albums in. And they're just they're they're at a different pace than me right now. Like they're reliving all the glory days, like touching more money than I think they ever touched before. And you know, it's like a family, and I don't think I'm part of that inclusive staten island brooklyn new york family right. but it's like the ones who respect me respect me and let it be known when they see me like between the the, the clan the group and the management and stuff and those that don't also make it very vocal and you know I'll, I'll take the good with the bad every time because again just like you said i'm working with your artists that were your dream artists these were my dream artists and when i decided to start my nr firm it was a blessing for me to be able to bring clientele in that I grew up admiring these dudes. Like, do you, do you think when my brother picked me up in his red Mercury tracer and we were bumping doggy style and cassette that I ever fathomed that one day I'd work with Snoop Dogg? Come on. Or that like my family would get to meet him or like we'd be having dinner with members of Wu-Tang or Snoop or Corrupt or whoever it might be. Like I've lived out all my dreams as an artist have a Guinness World Record. I've toured America. I've performed overseas. I've had M80 albums, M80 Almighty and Glass, or not Glass City, M80 and Almighty albums that made that made Billboard charts. Like, so as far as me as an artist, you know, people like sometimes shit on my career, like, oh, you you weren't all that. Bro, you don't understand. Like, I, I live in reality. So I have to determine how far I think I can go and I'm willing to take it. I don't want to be the biggest rapper in the world at age 42. My last project came out in 2019 and it was my highest charting EP or like project period. It it was it debuted Billboard Top 40. And that was my most scale back shit. That didn't have Wu-Tang on it and Gucci Man and fucking, you know, Red Man and people like that. It was a, a EP called the Toledo EP that featured me. Like I'm essentially the biggest star of the album, which is a, a rare for me with all the features I do. Um, other guest artists and producers, all from Toledo. And I put like a thousand dollars into marketing, and I put a, like a grand into some videos and shit, and some an actual music video, a lyric video, and I used all my connections, bro, and it took off. That's awesome. That's real good. That's real dope. So, speaking of um, the artists and things of that nature, because let's just get into it. Um, 